Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Pleased to have you for another at-home edition of our Banner Lecture Series. Uh, as always, a deep gratitude to you, our members, for helping to make our programming possible. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you very much. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a couple of reminders. Uh, one is that you can ask questions. So please be sure to log in Facebook or YouTube. Uh, to ask a question for our speaker, uh, and we'll relay those uh, at the uh, at the end of the program. A couple of upcoming program notes before we get started uh, tonight at 7 p.m. Be sure to tune in to Movie Myth Busting. Uh, this is where you get to watch a film uh, and then interact uh, with our staff. Uh, to talk about what's true and what's not. Uh, tonight we'll be featuring uh, the film Harriet, so please be sure to tune in for that. Uh, and then on Friday, uh, November 13th at noon, be sure to join us for our Curators at Work program, which is entitled The Watercolor in Virginia. Uh, hopefully, as all of you know, uh, we are now hosting the 41st annual exhibition of the Virginia Watercolor Society which features 80 works from across the state. Uh, the VMHC has a very robust collection of its own, uh, nearly 600 pieces in the collection. So uh, our curators will be talking about uh, that collection in great depth. Our next banner lecture is scheduled for December 10th at noon, when Ralph Hambrick will be here to talk about transforming the James River in Richmond. Now for today's lecture. I'm extremely pleased to have with us today, uh, Dr. Peter Henriquez. Uh, Dr. Henriquez is an emeritus professor of history from George Mason University. He taught uh, both American and Virginia history there with a special emphasis on Virginia founding fathers uh, and is especially interested in George Washington. He's written a number of books on George Washington his works include The Death of George Washington, He Died As He Lived, uh, A Realistic Visionary, A Portrait of George Washington, and his most recent book, which was just published by the University of Virginia Press in September, uh, is First and Always a New Portrait of George Washington. But today he's going to take a really unique look at George Washington uh, from, I think, a different perspective than most people have, and uh, we're extremely pleased to have him here today. Please welcome Dr. Pe Peter Henriquez. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate that uh, nice in introduction. And uh, I wish I could come out and see you in person in the audience. Certainly a virtual presentation is better than no presentation at all. Uh, what, what I'd like to do as I start, I basically want to tell you I approach discussions about George Washington against the backdrop of three propositions. First is that America has never had a leader more important than George Washington. There were two seminal moments in the founding of the United States of America, the winning of independence and the establishment of nationhood, and the two were not the same. In both achievements, George Washington was the central and crucial figure as the drama unfolded. In essence, no George Washington, no United States of America. And secondly, it's no secret uh, that I have great admiration and respect. Full disclosure, I even wear a medallion of him around my neck. But the third aspect is that to the degree possible, I seek to understand the flesh and blood man, warts and all and go wherever the evidence may lead. And that's what I want to do uh, today uh, in my present presentation. Let's just set my slideshow up here. The title of my talk is What Made George Washington Dick? Uh, and basically, it will be summarizing uh, the last chapter in my new book uh, uh, of a uh, first and always a new portrait of George Washington. Now, what made Washington tick? Honestly, it's not an easy task. 
because George Washington was the most fully concealed of all the founding fathers. Washington desperately wanted to be famous, but he did not wish to be truly known. And no doubt, there are some things about this great man that we can never know. And I make no claims to fully understanding the real George Washington. But just because we can never know the real George Washington any more than we can really know exactly how the human brain and human consciousness work, that doesn't mean we can't increase our knowledge either of the human brain or of George Washington. We can and we will. And it's in that spirit fully recognizing the difficulty of the task. I'd like, after my many years of studying this truly remarkable man, to give you my sense of what makes him tick. In the summer of 1783, as the peace talks in Paris between Great Britain and its former American colonies were grinding on, George Washington wrote plaintively to his brother Jack about how eager he was for the arrival of the definitive treaty, which he declared would put an end to his public life forever. The burden of public service would be over, and Washington could do what he really wanted to do. I have no wish which aspires beyond the ha humble and happy lot of living and dying a private citizen on my farm. Despite such assertion so often given, the historical evidence strongly suggests that George Washington is not a man to be satisfied with living and dying a private citizen on his farm, even on an estate as beautiful as his beloved Mount Vernon. Now, as an historian, I am very aware of the need to be skeptical of psychohistory. Much of it can be properly designated as psychobabble. Nevertheless, I find the ideas provided by the psychoanalyst Carl Jung have helped me understand Washington's character. Jung posits that forces in the subconscious often drive people, prompting them to erect self-defense mechanisms against unwanted self-knowledge. Central to understanding how this happens are Jung's concept of the persona and the shadow self. The persona, that's Latin for mask, is how we present ourselves to others and how we wish the world to see us. In direct contrast, the shadow self resides in the subconscious and is an entity that one might be defined as the sum of all personal and collective psychic elements, which because of their incompatibility with the chosen conscious attitude are denied expression in life. Briefly, think of your shadow self as that part of you that you hope you are not, but at some level fear you might be. Now, after many years of study, my conclusion is these insights are useful in deciphering what made George Washington tick. Specifically, if I were to summarize the thesis very briefly, it is that George Washington's shadow self hungered for public acclaim while he could still revel in it. Now that George Washington ardently sought fame across the ages is a pretty commonplace claim and has been recognized by many Washington scholars. Washington's closest female friend, Eliza Powell, a most perceptive uh, confident, uh, wrote to him uh, and said that the love of honest fame has and ever will be predominant in the best, the noblest, and the most capable natures. Now, unlike most Washington scholars, I argue that this yearning for honest fame, one might call it untarnished fame, is an essential key to understanding George Washington. Well, I put a lot of emphasis on it. Uh, way back in 1799, the Rosetta Stone was discovered. And what the Rosetta Stone allowed scholars to do is to finally make ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics comprehensible. 
because on that stone there was a decree on behalf of Ptolemy V that was inscribed both in Greek and in hieroglyphics, as well as demotics, that allowed scholars to finally make sense out of what previously had been indecipherable. I think Washington's desire for honest fame, especially when viewed through the lens of his public persona and private shadow self, can serve as our Rosetta Stone for understanding key themes that drove him throughout his life. Essentially, uh, I would argue that at an unstated but deep level, he craved the ego-based gratification that came from public affirmation of the notion that he was special and essential in the creation of the nation. George Washington would certainly vehemently disagree with this analysis. While he would admit that he desired the good opinion of honest men, friends to freedom, and well-wishers of mankind, he would heatedly deny that he hungered to have public adulation cascade upon him. Rather, Washington would likely more be inclined to prefer a term that has been a favorite of his eulogist from 1799 until the present day, selfless. Now, I maintain that the frequent use of this altruistic term clouds our understanding of the flesh and blood, George Washington. No doubt he sacrificed personal happiness on the altar of country. But at the same time, he was one of the least selfless men that ever lived. A selfless man does not end up possessing over 50,000 acres of land, control over 300 slaves, and qualifying as one of the richest men in America. Indeed, the very vehemence with which he denied his desire for public adoration lends credence to the view that his shadow self craved such a claim. Time and time again, Washington went out of his way to deny having such feelings, arguing they had no appeal uh, for him. Uh, the fervor of his denials uh, recalls Shakespeare's famous line in Hamlet uh, to the effect that a character doth protest too much. Nowhere was Washington more explicit in protesting that he acted out of love of country uh, than in an undelivered draft of his first inaugural address. This abandoned oration, had sharp words for anyone, quote, who could imagine me capable of being so smitten with the allurements of sensual gratification, the frivolities of ceremony, or the baubles of ambition, as to be induced from such motives to accept a public appointment. I shall only lament his imperfect acquaintance. In another instance, he wrote a friend, I consider it as an indubitable mark of mean spiritedness and pitiful vanity to court applause from the pen or tongue of man. Early in his presidency, writing to the ardent admirer Catherine Macaulay Graham in England, he wrote, All see and most admire the glare which hovers around the external trappings of elevated office. To me, there's nothing in it beyond the luster which may be reflected in its connection with the power of promoting human felicity. He wrote to his good friend, David Stewart, I can truly say I'd rather be at Mount Vernon with a friend or two about me than to be attended at the seat of government by the officers of state and representatives of every power in Europe. To the former aide, James McHenry, in a letter about his journey to Mount Vernon upon the conclusion of his presidency, he wrote, the attentions we met with on our journey were very flattering. And to some whose minds are differently formed than mine, might have been highly relished. But I avoided in every instance where I had any previous knowledge of the intention of all parades or escorts. Repeatedly, Washington asserted he served the public strictly out of a sense of duty to country. He wanted observers to understand and to report that in accepting any type of public service, he was not seeking adulation. And the record shows that many different people did just that. 
I think an excellent example of Washington's view is in a letter that he wrote to Governor George Clinton as he prepared to enter New York City in April of 1789 for his inauguration as the first president of the United States. Uh, Washington wrote, I can assure you with the utmost sincerity that no reception can be so congenial to my feelings as a quiet entry devoid of ceremony. Of course, as Washington obviously knew, such a request would have been impossible to honor. The excitement of Washington coming, it was like to a coronation. This is a drawing of him approaching uh, New York City for the inauguration. Uh, and indeed, if my analysis has some merit, a truly unheralded appearance would have been, in fact, deeply disappointing. Now, these examples demonstrate a key aspect of Washington's public persona and core identity, namely that he always acted out of a profound sense of duty characterized by an attitude of disinterested service towards the greater good. However, an analysis of his actions considered over his lifetime demonstrates that Washington was not simply a selfless man or one simply engaged in disinterested service. Uh, rather, a pattern emerges of a man who was deeply ambitious, massively concerned with his reputation, and in regular search of approbation of an adoring public, even as he denied such desires. Indeed, if we consider the shadow self, that portion of the psyche that one fears one is, but hopes one is not, we can readily interpret Washington's repeated assertions as attempts to justify to himself and others that he did not really seek power and influence for any inner grat gratification. Now, where Washington's incredible drive for recognition came from is really impossible to pinpoint. Certainly part of it emerged as a function of his basic temperament, which was very high on extroversion. By extroversion, I mean outgoing, risk-taking, focusing on approaching goals with an emphasis on acquisition. Uh, in his youth, Washington's goal basically was to rise to maximum prominence in Virginia society. And that society, as many of you from your studying the Virginia Historical Society know, it was patriarchal, hierarchical, deferential, and completely dominated by members of a gentry that set itself apart from common folk by their number of slaves, their manner of dress, as William Byrd shows here, their sumptuous lifestyle, and their literacy. Now, Washington, as a youngster, faced significant obstacles in his quest. His family was gentry, but only second-tier status, and that was made shaky by his father's untimely death in 1743. Besides significant financial stress, the loss also meant that young Washington, then only 11, would be raised by a strong-willed, controlling, and emotionally demanding single mother intent on having her firstborn and favorite child focus on meeting her needs rather than achieving his goals. As an aside, one of the chapters in my new book focuses on this very important and complicated uh, relationship between Washington and mother. Of course, certain factors went George's way. Uh, primary among them was the marriage of his half-brother Lawrence now the master of Mount Vernon, into the very powerful Fairfax family. Through regular visits to the Fairfax family manor at Elvar, which in a sense was his finishing school, George learned what it meant to be a true Virginia gentleman. And Belvoir's master, William Fairfax, he was a member of the governor's council, most important individual in Northern Virginia, and he became Washington's mentor and champion, almost like Washington was the son he wished he had. And that was a key event, the opening doors uh, for Washington's future. Now, given my thesis that Washington had conflicting feelings about his own drives, it's worth noting that his hunger for worldly success conflicted with his upbringing, especially his mother's values. 
more steeped in faith than her son, the widowed Mary Ball Washington, held that honor, fame, and wealth paled as rewards in comparison with eternal happiness. Stacked against God's glory, her theology saw the honors of the earth as so much rust. They were, quote, poor, empty, insipid things in the final county. Now, despite such an upbringing, as I illustrate in the chapter in, in my book, the evidence indicates that Washington cared more about the immortality of his legacy than he did about the immortality. Although investing little attention in his own heavenly personal life after death, Washington was deeply invested in ensuring the continuation of his earthly legacies. His views, which never changed, appeared early in a famous 1758 letter to the bewitching Sally Fairfax. In this letter, uh, Washington refers to the death of the young British officer and says, who is there that does not rather envy than regret a death that gives birth to honor and glorious memory? Uh, you envy one that gives birth to honor and glorious memory. In a revealing personal letter to a friend and confidant, the Marquis de Lafayette in 1788, Washington explains one major way of achieving glorious memory. Introducing the American poet, Joe Barlow, Washington wrote, Mr. Barlow is considered by those who are good judges to be one of those bards who hold the keys of the gate by which patriots, sages, and heroes are admitted to immortality. Such are your ancient bards who are both the priests and doorkeepers for the Temple of Fame. And these, my dear Marquis, are no vulgar functions. Uh, men of real talents and arms have commonly approved themselves patrons of the liberal arts and friends to the poets. In some instances, by acting reciprocally, heroes have made poets and poets heroes. Now, this reference to heroes making poets and poets making heroes is especially pertinent when it comes to looking at Washington's attitude towards becoming subject of a biography. Now, his public attitude uh, was very clear. Uh, any memoirs uh, of my life, distinct and unconnected with the general history of the war, would rather hurt my feelings than tickle my pride whilst I lived. I had rather glide gently down the stream of life, leaving it to posterity to think and say what they please of me, than by an act of mind to have vanity or ostentation imputed to me. Vanity is not part of my character. Now, this declaration contrasts sharply with George Washington's effort to enlist David Humphreys, former military aide, to write the general's biography while he was still living. Uh, David Humphreys was one of the most uh, important aides to Washington at many different times. This is the picture of Washington uh, returning his commission at the end of the war and the officer next to him, that is uh, David Humphreys. Uh, here's a picture of Humphreys uh, at a later stage. Now, in writing, wa Washington in writing Humphreys offered Humphreys a temporary home in Mount Vernon with the promise that he would be treated as one of the family. He offered complete access to Washington's past trove of papers, full access to ask Washington about various issues, etc. Washington explained why he wanted Humphreys to undertake the task of a biography. And in his letter to Humphreys, he said, I should be pleased indeed to see you undertake this business. Your abilities as a writer, your discernment respecting the principles which led to the decision by arms, your personal knowledge of many facts as they occurred in the progress of the war, your disposition to justice, candor, and impartiality, and your diligence in investigating truth combiningly fit you when joined with the vigor of life for this. But certainly, the general knew 
that Humphreys would not be impartial, at least in this way that we would use the term. In this case, I believe Washington hoped a poet would help make a hero. And Humphreys was a poet whose admiration and affection for his commander was, like Lafayette's, boundless. Consider this 1782 verse uh, characterizing the general that Humphreys wrote. The foe then trembled at the well-known name and raptured thousands to his standard game. His martial skill our rising armies formed his patriotic zeal, their generous bosom warm. His voice inspired, his godlike presence led, the Briton saw, and from his presence fled. Indeed, Humphrey saw in George Washington a godlike presence. Who better to chronicle the life of someone desiring fame across the age? Humphreys did reside at Mount Vernon for several years wrote a partial draft that he never completed. Washington read over this material and commented and made corrections to what in effect is a brief partial autobiography. Interestingly, Washington ordered Humphreys to destroy his notations, but in this case, Humphreys disobeyed and the resulting record has some rather interesting revelations. In one comment indicative of how he chose uh, to be uh, remembered, Washington wrote, whether it be necessary to mention that my time and services were given to the public without compensation and that every direct and indirect attempt afterwards to reward them was refused, you can best judge. Can there be any doubt that he expected Humphreys to invoke his sacrifice? Further evidence of Washington's desire for secular immortality appears in his extraordinary concern with preserving his papers, both private and public. From early on, the record of his existence fascinated uh, George Washington. As my former professor at UVA, William Abbott, Abbott, one of the editors of the Washington Papers, put it, Washington reveals perhaps most clearly, if indirectly, his sense the sense he came to have of his importance that his life held for history and posterity in his attitude towards his papers, which he had gone to extraordinary lengths to gather and protect, and for which he had planned to erect a building to hold, indeed, in essence, the first uh, presidential library. Happily, as you, as you know, that library now at Mount Vernon, the Fred Smith Library, uh, is a wonderful repository. And the papers are yet not finished, being done by University of Virginia Press, uh, University of Virginia and, and Mount Vernon. There'll be about 90 volumes, each uh, of about 700 pages. Massive amount of material to go through. Frankly, another way in which Washington courted, courted future recognition included a dedication to the creation of his likeness. Uh, all sorts of paintings and portraits of Washington. He seemed to be willing to sit for virtually any artist offering to paint his portrait. Uh, or as he, as he did uh, in 1785 at the request of the great French sculptor, uh, Oudon, that came to America to do this bust of Washington is the greatest likeness and just an unbelievable uh, treasure that we have. And he was willing uh, to endure, Washington was willing to endure the discomfort of having a life mask made in order to produce uh, this lifelike end result. And a final example of Washington acting to promote his secular immortality is the very high likelihood, not certainty, but very high likelihood, that while he kept it from public knowledge, he apparently decided to locate his tomb at the heart of the United States Capitol building. Washington, as most of you know, was a nationalist, envisioning a great future for the United States, uh, which he often referred to as a rising empire. Washington saw the great European capitals as models for their American counterpart, and he put the full force of his personal authority into building a great metropolis on the banks of the Potomac. 
He felt without such a strong centripetal force at the center, both figuratively and literally, the president worried that the new country dissolved in the multiple and vulnerable Confederacy. After late Pierre L'Enfant was removed as the architect, the new architect uh, for the capital uh, was uh, William Thornton, uh, who almost certainly, after discussion with and approval by the president, Thornton, who came to view Washington, in his words, as his greatest friend on earth, drew up plans for a structure for the central rotunda. In that rotunda, at the capital's exact center, was to stand an equestrian statue of Washington atop the hero's eventual final resting place containing his remains interesting that right after Washington's death, President John Adams moved to make that so in the form of a request to the widowed Martha Washington. And Martha agreed with the proviso that she should be buried alongside him. I think her willingness to comply indicates that the script for this public drama had been at least approved by George Washington, uh, if not uh, written by him. Of course, the transfer never took place. The incident is significant. And I think the decision to be entombed at the heart of the United States Capitol merits further examination. For example, contrast this with Washington's directive on what to do with his body following his death. He wrote, it is my express desire that my corpse be interred in a private manner without parade or funeral oration. I think there's a contradiction in these statements that highlights the tension in our effort to understand what forces drove George Washington. Uh, I suspect his persona and his shadow self were in conflict. Now, much evidence in the historical record demonstrates that Washington, in fact, did strive to be special and work to have others see him as such from his youth until his death. Although he invited, uh, asserted that vanity was not part of his character, uh, there can be little doubt that Washington took enormous pride in his appearance. This uh, uh, porthole painting might be uh, slightly exaggerated, but it demonstrates the remarkable physicality. Washington had a natural athleticism that he worked hard to maintain and enhance. He took fencing lessons, not because he expected to run a foe through, but rather to improve his graceful movements. He became a marvelous dancer, and more significantly, the best horseman of his age, both skills that were highly admired and drew favorable notice from onlookers. And of course, he got to dress for the nine for the event. And this brings us to his attention to his apparel. In his world, appearances mattered, and Washington wanted both to fit in and to be noticed. He early developed and displayed a detailed personal style. I I really think one can say he dressed strategically, almost theatrically, whatever the part. Junior officer on the make, fox hunting planter, senior military commander, uh, or president. The attention that Washington paid to his military uniforms is particularly telling, especially as it pertains to his desire to be viewed as exceptional. It's interesting that I, there's an invoice that had survived on the eve of the French and Indian War that shows Washington spending fully one third of his salary that he collected as adjutant for Southern Virginia on a new dress uniform from England, of the rich crimson coat, glorious with gold braid and 48 gold gilt buttons. Such regimentals distinguished him from other military personnel who did not have them or could not afford them. That same invoice included two handsome livery suits emblazoned with his coat of arms for his servants to wear, making it clear that he expected to ride them out in high style. His decision, so well known to wear his, and it's his new, not his old uniform, a new military uniform of buff and blue to the Second Continental Congress 
1775 was no aberration. Interestingly, immediately after he was appointed commander-in-chief, he paid a Philadelphia tailor 12 pounds to make regimentals of better workmanship, materials, and trimmings than the set that was recently sewn by Mount Vernon's indentured and less skilled tailor. And then Washington soon ordered a blue ribbon or sash to distinguish myself, in quotes. He did not mothball his uniform with the conclusion of the war in 1783. Significantly, when he decided to attend the Constitutional Convention in the spring of 1787, he brought his uniform with him, donning it once again to ride triumphantly into Philadelphia, escorted by the city's militia to the huzzas of the crowd. Uh, T.H. Green has written an interesting book on Washington's journey as president. Uh, this is a picture actually of him coming into New York that makes the point. Explains as president, Washington toured the states to enlist them in achieving his vision of the unified nation. His presentation extended to pausing before entering a town, to put on his vintage uniform, mount a large white stallion, Prescott, whose hooves were painted and polished before each appearance. And he would leave onlookers with a lifelong memory of him and his glory. His love of uniforms lasted all his life. When he was summoned from retirement after the presidency, to become commander-in-chief during the quasi-war with France in 1798, he focused considerable attention on what his new uniform would look like. The design called for extensive embroidery, and it prompted the general to tell his tailor to engage whichever embroiderer is, quote, most celebrated and esteemed the best. Now, Washington's deaf use of wardrobe to communicate power and cement loyalty seems to have served him well. Though, of course, his countrymen's admiration and affection derived from much more than fabric and guilt. Americans loved him for how he conducted himself especially in the aftermath of his appointment as commander of chief of the Continental Army in 1770. That's the event that thrust him into the spotlight where he will remain for the next 24 and a half years. The American cause badly needed heroes. And naturally, America looked first to their new military commander. John Adams expressed the appeal that Washington had for so many Americans then and later. A gentleman of one of the first fortunes on the continent, leaving his delicious retirement, family and friends, sacrificing his ease and hazarding all in the cause of his country. That no doubt is how the mature George Washington wished people to see him, and indeed how the vast majority of Americans did see him. I maintain that shortly after his appointment as the commander in chief, Washington came to believe that Providence had chosen him for an epic role to embody the noblest of Roman attributes, disinterested virtue, and to do so in a just cause. It would expand Republican government and human freedom. And for the remainder of his life, Washington fashioned and wore a public mask of extraordinary revolutionary virtue. In the words of his friend John Trumbull, Washington acted under a mask of the deepest reserve and assumed the most impenetrable character I ever knew. Makes it so hard to get him. Now, to do this, it was no easy task to be the embodiment of revolutionary virtue. And Washington constantly wondered if he was carrying it off successfully. Obviously, his elevation offered great possibilities, but also great risk, especially for a man who, hunger though he might for fame and honor, also deeply feared failure and its accompanying humiliation. One of the things in trying to understand Washington is a constant tension between his desire for fame and his fear. His ultimate victory in war seemed to temporarily silence any overt critics. In December of 1783, Washington in Annapolis, Maryland, that's where the Capitol was temporarily held, and you can go and stand where Washington stood to give his uh, commission back with a, a wonderful address, 
uh, this is the consummate Republican gesture, giving back the commission and going back to civilian life. Here is the American Cincinnatus, the man who left his agrarian idol to fight for and obtain his country's liberty, mission accomplished, seated power, and sent about resuming life at his beloved farm. That's the role that Washington consciously played and believed Providence had given him. Indeed, this role playing, there's numerous theatrical references in Washington's correspondence, indicating that he sees the world as a stage in which each person has a role to play. I don't think it's a miss to picture Washington constantly on stage, seeking to fulfill his role as the indispensable man who was required for the successful birthing of the nation. Although I need to add a caveat, we don't want to see him simply as an actor. Indeed, the Greek word for actor means hypocrite, pretending to be who one is not. Washington was no hypocrite. He believed in the role he was playing, the embodiment of revolutionary virtue. Now, his longing to live under his own vine and fig tree was not posturing, but it was a key part of his essence. Mount Vernon was his hobby as well as his home, an expression of his livelihood and ancestry. Washington identified Mount Vernon with autonomy from public responsibilities, a setting in which he reigned supreme and felt secure. Now, had Washington simply desired autonomy, Dean Mount Vernon's master would have sufficed. But he held in his head and in his heart irreconcilable ambitions. As much as he prized autonomy, freedom from the influence of others, he prized power, influence exerted through dominance, and love, influence granted through affiliation even more. There can be little doubt that George Washington was strongly drawn to the centers of influence and power. I like to think like iron filings are drawn to a magnet. That's why, while desiring to be at Mount Vernon, he often felt compelled to leave it. In the words of the wonderful hit musical Hamilton, Washington wanted to be in the room where it happened. But he was drawn even more powerfully by the need for love. Of course, not romantic affection, but love and admiration of right-minded men and women everywhere. To win the esteem of those he admired was his persistent goal. And he constantly strove to make himself worthy of their admiration. And he constantly fretted that he might lose it. To be at the center of power and influence. And to win and keep the affections and admiration of his compatriots required an enormous investment of time and energy, much of it on things he would rather not have done. Something had to give, and ultimately that was his individual autonomy. The price Washington paid uh, was heavy indeed. Uh, like Faust, forced to pay the price of his ambition. George Washington discovered that fame and veneration pursued over a lifetime only be had at enormous cost. I believe that George Washington would assort the enormous cost of public service was worth enormous sacrifices he made. He believed, as he wrote to Lafayette, the way the leader of a country could immortalize his name, quotes, was by enhancing the prosperity and happiness of his people. In other words, the success of the American experiment would give George Washington the secular immortality he saw. His self-love and love of country coincided. Indeed, I think they were inseparable. The last words that people utter before their death often take on special meaning, especially the words of uh, public and famous people. George Washington's last words were, "'Tis well." Examining the actual context in which these words were uttered, uttered makes them rather mundane. Washington, fearful of being buried alive, wanted to be sure that his faithful secretary, Tobias Lear, understood that he was not to be buried 
until he was dead for at least two days. When Lear finally acknowledged that he understood, Washington responded, "'Tis well." Yet, in a broader sense, this declaration is perfectly apt. George Washington could look back over his remarkable life as a whole and conclude his well. To his everlasting credit, he had been able to tame whatever demons lurked in his shadow self and live a life of honor uncorrupted by what he called left-handed attempts to acquire popularity. Regardless of the forces of his shadow self, he was truly a remarkable man, and his sacrifices a gift to mankind and his beloved country. Among the founding fathers of the great unfinished symphony that is America, George Washington holds a place unique and immortal, first and always. He fathered no children. But in a symbolic sense, the United States of America was his offspring. Without him, the great experiment in Republican government never would have had a chance to thrive. The occasion of his first inauguration, a New York newspaper went on at length listing honors and praises according to him and concluded he deserved it all. Yes, he did. And it is well that he received it. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, a look at George Washington, I think, that, that most people have, have never heard before. Folks, uh, again, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please sign in to Facebook or YouTube, and we'll relay your, your question to Dr. Henriquez. Curious, Peter, uh, you mentioned a quote from John Adams. Uh, is there any evidence in any of the writings of any of the other uh, founding fathers who, who worked very closely with Washington that, that might support uh, this hypothesis uh, that you presented today? Um, th I'm glad that you, you asked that question. Let me, there, there's, an, there's an interesting, and I found this after I wrote my finish my book. Actually, my next project is going to be a project on the relationship between John Adams and George Washington. They're full-scale books on Washington and Madison, Washington and Jefferson, Washington and Hamilton, Washington and Franklin, not one on John Adams. And I, it's an interesting relationship along, along that line. But I got reading Adams' correspondence in connection with this, and I came upon this very interesting quote. Obviously, this is uh, this is, you know, George, this is Washington lives in an age uh, before Freud. It's not Washington knows nothing about the shadow self. He's not. He might have the feeling, but he doesn't. Obviously, he does not come into his conscious being. He's not being a hypocrite here. John Adams wrote this very interesting quote. Uh, Washington certainly did not know his own heart. He believed what he said of his aversion to public life and his attachment to retirement. But nothing could be farther from the real true temper of his mind. He knew not himself, could not be easy in retirement. And he concluded Washington loved adulation and could not resist her charm. Uh, as someone who was kind of going out on a limb with this interpretation, uh, it was interesting to me when I found this quote by Adams. Adams sometimes is way off in his assessments, but sometimes, like his quotes about Thomas Jefferson, I think very spot on. So I was struck. Uh, I was struck by that example. Uh, so, do you think that there's any uh, any possibility that uh, Washington consciously? promoted his humility rather than it being simply part of his subconscious drive? That's a good question. That's a good, good question, and not, not an easy one. I mean, Washington is, he's almost the exact obverse of our current president in that every job he approaches, he says he's not capable of doing it. He's going to make 
mistakes. He apologizes for all his errors. You should have picked somebody else who could do it better than I. Part of that is because he has this fear of failure. I can't help but think part of it is also it proves to be a very effective mechanism of lowering expectations and then surpassing them. Uh, and Washington is a very, very wise man. And I can't help but think of some of this. He recognizes the power and ability of, of acting in the way that he does. Uh, but so, so there is a certain amount of, of this that he's consciously sensitive. I do not think, I mean, if Washington was here, as I said at the beginning, he'd vehemently disagree with my, uh, with my analysis. He was not consciously saying, oh, I love all this. I'm going to, like, I remember when I, now I have 12 grandchildren, four granddaughters. Now they're all too old. But when the, when the granddaughters were young, I used to have a fun game where I would say, no kisses today. You can't kiss and they'd work and I'd lose and they would kiss me. Uh, you know, this was a Macallian block. Uh, I'm not saying that Washington is is doing it in that, in, in that connection. Uh, but there's no way I'll, no one could ever be sure how much of this is conscious, uh, how much of this comes from his fear of failure. Uh, it's, it's a good question. There's certainly an element of it. I just don't think anyone would be able to. If, if, if you look at a uh, chocolate milkshake, you put some syrup in the vanilla ice cream, you can tell there's chocolate syrup in there. How much chocolate syrup is in there? I don't know. How much of what you say is conscious planning and clever strategy? I really don't know. Uh, but there's an element of it. So you said you, you've been going out on a limb with this hypothesis about GW. Uh, how, how have your colleagues uh, and other fellow historians uh, reacted to this hypothesis? Uh, I've been very, very pleased so far. I have, you know, on the back of my book, I've got nice quotes from people like Rick Bookmaser and Robert McDonald and John Furl and Nat Philbrook uh, and a number of other people have gone on uh, on Amazon to to make comments. There, there was one comment of the person who liked the book said, except for the last chapter uh, where the author engaged in psychobabble. Uh, and I imagine some critics will say, I am aware of it. I am putting forth a hypothesis for consideration based on my own study, which I think helps give us a better insight to the flesh and blood George Washington. Uh, but I'm certainly not doing it with the confidence that I might say that Donald Trump is a narcissist or something like that. I mean, this is, this is a hypothesis. Uh, and People can read the chapter uh, and agree or disagree. But um, this is, to me, it's a helpful tool to try to get a better understanding of the most important man in our history and a man who deliberately does not be known. Uh, and I, I think it can shed some light on it. And that's at least I put that forth as my effort to the conversation. And I'll let, I'll let other people uh, make the final decision. Do you think there are parallels with, with Washington's character in this respect, in this context that you've, you've laid out with other presidents that we've had? Not enough of an action. Certainly, I think if there is a general rule among people who become president, most of them are are deeply ambitious and driven people. You don't usually end up at the top of the pile, one, without a tremendous drive, and two, without a great deal of good luck. Uh, the, you know, president Obama wouldn't have been president if Bush had not been before him. Trump wouldn't have been president if Obama had not been before him, and Biden would not be president-elect if it had not been for Trump before him. Things have to break a certain way, but there is a driving force and a desire. You know, I think most of us have a desire for to be remembered, uh, to not to be forgotten. Whether we're whether we're writing a street book or 
raising our family or giving to a charity or something else. Washington's desire and for secular immortality, we all desire freedom, power, uh, and, uh, and love. Uh, Washington desires it at an extremely high level uh, and would be not as satisfied to be a colonel in the army. Somebody else to raise to be a colonel in the army would be very, very pleased. Washington is driven, and I think most presidents are. Well, a question from uh, one viewer is, uh, did Washington feel that he achieved or obtained first-level Virginia aristocracy? Yes, he did, uh, thanks to his bride, Martha Dandridge Custis. Uh, she was the wealthiest widow uh, in, in Virginia. And by marrying her and being able to control her estate, he moves into the very top prominence. It's kind of interesting, once he reaches this level, some of his earlier letters are rather obsequiously desiring, like the French and Indian Wars, efforts with Lord Loudon to get command into the British army, very obsequious kind of letters. You don't see that after his, after his marriage. Uh, so he is, uh, that is the key to put him in the very top level of Virginia prominence. Although I should hasten as I mentioned in passing, although I'm sure Martha's money was an appealing part of her overall uh, appeal, uh, this is a genuine love story between two people. It is not a marriage. Uh, it might have started out uh, as something of a marriage of convenience because Martha found someone of honor and integrity in a manager of state. Uh, but uh, I, it's, it's a wonderful relationship uh, over the years. So I don't, I don't want to leave the impression that Washington saw uh, his Martha as a widow that he could get into her access, but oh, I don't doubt that part of many appealing aspects of her character. And finally, can you tell us a little bit more about your next project? The basic, the basic trust is to try to figure out uh, Adams and Washington, they're both in many ways similar in their political philosophy. They both have a skeptical view of human nature. They're both very much in the Federalist camp. Uh, I know when, when Washington's going to leave the presidency after two terms, he speaks to Adams. Adams writes his wife and says, the president and I agree completely. Uh, Adams, of course, was the person who proposed Washington. He nominated Washington to be commander-in-chief. And yet, they are not close at all. Uh, and indeed, Adams is really kind of the forgotten man in you have Madison and Hamilton and Jefferson as being key forces. Adams is a man of equal uh, mental ability. Uh, he and Washington have a strained relation. And I want to explore why, because of their combination of personality traits, why Adams... Adams has tremendous admiration for Washington, mixed in with some envy and jealousy and annoyance because Adams is convinced he's vastly smarter than Adams, uh, than Washington, much better educated. He even said Washington's clearly too illiterate for his high station. Uh, and Washington gets all the adulation and praise. And Adams, who also is a very ambitious man for glory, he's more openly admitting of it. And Washington. So I want to kind of go into depth and see if I can get a little better sense of both men and hopefully their relationship might add a little bit more light to their, to the characters of both people. But I would hope. Well, we'll certainly look forward to, to reading that. Uh, Dr. Peter Henry gave a fascinating lecture showing us a very different side of George Washington. Thank you so much. Uh, folks, if you would like to, to order uh, Dr. Henrique's current book, First and Always, you can go to our website, www.shopvirginiahistory.org, uh, to order the book. Uh, and please join us uh, on December 10th for our next banner lecture. 
where Ralph Hambrick will be talking about transforming the James River in Richmond. Thank you all again for joining us. Have a good afternoon and stay safe. Bye-bye.